So Digital Surge has asked myself to do a uh, talk on big data. Um, and you can let me know at the end whether it was worthwhile. So I'm going to ask you all um, to join at uh, slido.com. So if you just go to slido.com and you, go to, um, you enter that number. Uh, alternatively, if you're on your smartphone, you can stick a picture of that. And it'll direct you straight to the slide of. In fact, I'm going to do it now. Make sure that's. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the open, the big data. It's a huge ecosystem. Lots of things that exist within it. Uh, I'm a big fan of um, of uh, open open data, open source. Uh, these are some of the open. Um, there's some open apps in there. They're all meant to be open, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of that. Um, so my question really for you guys, this is where, Margaret, um, this is where the, uh, the Slido comes in. So I'm going to ask you to put in a word. So I'm going to try and be fancy here and do a uh, word cloud. Um, what brings you to this big data webinar? So give me one word or at most two to tell me um, oh, it was curiosity, it was, I was bored, um, I'm procrastinating over work, I was told to, um, I'm interested in, well, just interested, uh, technology, um, confused, uh, things like that, whatever comes to your mind as to why you're here. I'm going to put one in too, actually. Can you add another one? Can you? Yeah, absolutely. Two? Yeah, you should, you should be able to. Oh, I'm not a second. Are you allowed to? No, you can. You can. I didn't know if we were allowed. We can, yeah. If you just click, if you tap it again. Yeah. No idea. Yeah, no. Join the club. So I'll give you another 10 seconds or so. Crack challenges. Oof, like that. Okay, data fighter from my son's protocol results. Protocol results? I'm intrigued now. Right, so education is the big one. Okay, well, I, I hope that I cover that in um, this in upcoming webinar. Suspense must be killing you by now. So back we go. Um, first of all, I think it might be apt to discuss what data is first of all before we even move on to what big data is and data this may look weird to you but this is the origin and the history and the evolution of data so hold on till i refer to my notes here um, so the earliest evidence of counting by man occurs before the dawn of written history and involves what is typically referred to as a notch so that's the bad boys here the earliest record we have for such man-made marks is an annual bone that is dated to approximately 35,000 BC. It's known as the Libombo, sorry, I don't know why I can say that, Libombo bone. And it's the oldest known mathematical artifact. So that's this here. And the next one is another series of bones called the Ashanga bone, um, contains similar notches, and they date back to around about 20,000 BC. Um, so it, Initially, the idea of having a means of collecting data of numer numerics, counting, a counting system, um, was originally as notches. And there's notches on stones, on tab stone tablets, um, don't think they had iPads back then, uh, bones, trees, there's lots of different kinds of carvings. Then it moved on to um, the Babylonian stages and um, Babylonian numer numerals of 1800 BC. Could this be easier than decimal? 
you may ask why for why rebecca because in our current numerics we have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten or rather nine so it's really nine symbols we have to learn or you can say 10 because we have a zero get into that bit so there are nine symbols you have to learn whereas the babylonians are like why nine let's use two so they have this symbol and this symbol and a combination of those symbols make up 60 and their base number is 60 whereas our base number is 10 this may bring you back to your awful miles days of base log base 10. um so these kind of scriptures and means of data collection moved on and evolved over time um kind of a so or originated those stone tablets and the uh, or rather the, the bones anyway were in africa it would be the indian um continent that offered us the what we now know as our uh, numerical system and they learned through chinese merchants so uh this occurred as early as ninth century and the closest mathematics system we have to universal language it is the base 10 notation um, Hindi Arabic number system uh, adopted by mathematical communities worldwide. Um, in addition to, now this is, this is, but to me, this is fascinating, right? So, in addition to the Chinese merchant system, was the idea of zero. So, beforehand, there was no zero except for 10, as we now know it to be 10, and it has a zero in it. There was no zero. There was not a symbol for nothing. So, the idea of nothing is a foundational piece to the Indian belief system. Uh, this is where the notion of zero came from, and therefore the Ind Indians introduced zero not just as a placeholder, but as a number for calculations. The symbol was created from the holes left in the sand by stones moved for the calculations. And how we draw our uh, values currently are based on the angles. Um, so you can see that one has one angle and two is two and three and so on, and then zero, there are no angles because there were no stones. Interesting. There you go. That's data. Okay, it's the basis of where data came from. So, next question. Back to good old Slido. Do you have big data? Do you think in your current organization you have big data? This is not a trick question. It's just a general curiosity question. I will wait here until there's somebody typed in their, in their uh, slide. Of. I know that big data, they always say it's oh, lots of it. There's It comes really quickly. It has to be truthful. Don't worry, I don't worry. Yeah, I, I will be covering what it is soon. It's, uh... Boss, sometimes I think it's just something that you can't manage in a spreadsheet. You know, um, so going by that sort of thing, I'm unsure. I'm just thinking. That okay, get unsure then, because it's this is like I say, this isn't a true question. This is trying to garner an understanding of where there's so many different connotations to what big data is and to what people understand it to be. Um, this is the one thing about IoT, digitalization, and the tech um, transformation area in space right now is that there are very few def definitions, and that's quite um, evident in the standards and regulations around as well. Uh, so the idea of having, so for example, Germany um, don't enjoy the use of the government, anyway, don't enjoy the use of um, Amazon and their um, listening devices, mainly because they have legal regulations around the removal of data. So you cannot take data outside of Germany, um, which means that data collection services, that's why the app, Amazon have to be in Germany and, and in order to, and the, some of the warehouses are there, da data warehouses, because they can't transmit the data that they're collect they've collected over to their base in America. So um, it's, there's, there's so many different rules and regulations per country that it's so hard to have def def uh, definitive rules and regulations as a standard. Um, that goes across the board and that does include big data. Um, so what we have so far is that most people are unsure. That's OK. Um, 30 of you think that you do, and some say no. OK, cool. So what makes big data? Um, go back to this slide, because 
it means my, uh, my notes catch up with me. Um, what makes big data? So everything that produces information. So when the computer first originated in the early 70s, um, it was estimated that the technological per capita capacity was doubling every 40 months. So as of 2012, every day, 2.5 exabytes, and I have a bracket there what an exabyte is, that's 2.5 times 2 to the power 60, note the 60 there, uh, bytes, which obviously like, everyone knows what that is. Um, one exabyte is 1 billion gigabytes. That's 1,000 million gigabytes of data is generated every day. Uh, based on my DC report prediction, um, it's predicted to grow to 4.4 zettabytes, <laughs> which I believe is a million petabytes, which is, I believe, a million uh, exabytes. <laughs> so um, it's an extraordinary amount of data. And that is big data. Um, I got, conf not confused, I was very much in a position of uncertainty. And, Whenever I was trying to generate data from, or not generate, I was not generating data from the CNC machine. Um, I was extracting the data from the CNC machine and I was wondering, goodness, is this going to be big data? I was collecting, I'd narrowed down the parameters that I wished to, to look at to 154, I think, no, 128 variables. And that was coming at me less than one hertz. So um, 128 numbers were coming at me in less than a second. And I was collecting over a 24 hour period over months. And that was not big data. Um, I say that after having said there's no real definition. Um, it, it's, it's, I would say big data is data where you have to really consider where are you going to store all this because you don't have a PC. You don't have an external hard drive or USB pen or a, a network attached storage device big enough. Um, there are the V's of big data. Now, there are three V's, there are five V's, there are seven V's, there are eight V's, there are 10 V's. Um, there's many V's as you can think of to mean different things. I like the eight V's. Um, so V's are volume, velocity, veracity, variability, visualization, value, and variety, um, and then one going in there, which is vulnerability. Um, this is a pretty good paper here, if anyone's, of, uh, anyone's interested. I'll make these slides available to you all uh, at the end. Um, I'll give them to Gillian to disseminate. Um, but a multi-layer big data value chain approach for security issues. Big fan of security. Um, often left out of many discussions and talks and webinars and so on. So volume is how much do you have which is many people's um, understanding of big data, you know, it's the volume. And yes, that is one of the main, main contributing factors to big data, but also velocity. So I was mentioning how my um, collection was of one machine and I was getting it at about less than a second. I could be monitoring information such as the humidity of a room, which I don't need every 0.8 hertz. You know, I, it, can be once every three hours. But if you have multiple rooms, multiple locations, um, then that brings in the veracity um, aspect, which is no, even a that's accuracy. The variability, I believe, is what I was talking about there. It's different rooms and so on. And you have different types of data coming at you. Um, the variety aspect. So variety is supposed to variability, two different things. Variety is the types of data. So you could have information coming in, such as um, a government department could be monitoring their footfall through a room to determine do they need to have hybrid working scenarios, as well as having collected information coming in from the census. So there's information to be stored somewhere of different variety. So there's structured, unstructured, and semi-structured data. Um, visualization, where and how are you going to view this data? Um, veracity is the accuracy of the data. How do you understand whether this data is indeed accurate? Is it accurate enough? Um, let me check, I've got everything covered here. So, um, yeah, so the variety is 
biggest challenge with big data, um, different data types, and it's organizing the data in a meaningful way. Um, it's no simple task. Um, the variability, different from variety, is constantly changing and can significantly impact your data homogenization. So data homogenization is really important when you're coming to taking business insights from the data that you're collecting. You want to be able to um, provide structure to the data. And by structure, I'll get onto that later. Um, it's mainly a, um, finding a similar format. Uh, so veracity ensures that is accurate. And that requires processes to keep insufficient data from accumulating in your systems. So each one of these have connotations of tech stacks and tools behind them. So all of these together comprise of a big data framework or architecture. The simplest example is when contacts enter your marketing automation system, for example, with false names and inaccurate contact information. So how many times have you maybe come across um, a form that's been filled in and they've put the surname in the forename instead of the real column or their age is their date of birth instead of their actual age or and so on. So the information is there and there is accurate information there. It's just presented in an inaccurate manner. That's where Lintel comes in, by the way, plug there. But um, data validation pipeline, we can assess your information and ensure that it's um, appropriately formatted, cleaned and processed. That's all I'll say. So types of big data, we have structured. So transactions, financial records, uh, sensor data, um, data that is the same and consistent. Unstructured data would be the likes of text, documents, multimedia files, um, images, video files. Uh, your phone's probably filled with lots of unstructured data, uh, voice recordings, um, your music. Semi-structured would be uh, well, it's obviously the in-between stage between structured and unstructured. So um, I know I'd said that streaming data from sensors was unstructured, but it could be that your uh, data will be coming in different formats. So it could be that um, you have, say, for example, a DHT22 sensor, which is a temperature humidity sensor. It could be bringing in both humidity and temperature at the same time. And you could have either one of those in a different decimal place or significant, significant figure. Um, you have uh, perhaps an um, accelerometer uh, included in that, that hardware setup. Um, so there's sensors and combination sensors bringing in data of different types. You also have the likes of the unstructured data that has been categorized. So you have the likes of um, hashtags in Twitter. So with it being new, um, uh, a language which is inherently unstructured, you can structure it by using the hashtag. That's one of the reasons hashtags exist. In fact, it's the main reason hashtags exist. Um, it adds a sense of community, but it also is mainly a way of being able to um, filter out all the tweets to find where shifting social um, movements are. Um, there's a, an infographic version of that, because I know some people prefer visuals rather than, than words. So um, we have the structured data. It's pre defined data models, basically. It's a, adhering to a particular set schema. Resides in databases, stored in rows and columns. It's everything you imagine a structured data set would be, the likes you would find in in um, numerical Excel database um, or sheet. The unstructured data, no predefined data models, difficult to search. Um, a PDF that you can't click on and highlight and copy and paste, you know, it's um, images and videos. So again, it can, it can reside in warehouses and lakes, uh, can't reside, it, see, I would be, I would say this is potentially inaccurate in its omission, in that we have a comparison with structured by saying that it resides in relational databases. It doesn't, it cannot reside in a relational database, but it can reside in a non-relational database, the likes of um, PostgreSQL or um, MongoDB and so on. They are databases that allow for blobs, information blobs. Um, so yep, stored in various forms, and these are some examples similar to the previous slide. Semi-structured, 
loosely organized, as previously mentioned, uh, some sort of structure containing unstructured data. So JSON um, or HTML would be uh, one you may be more familiar with. If you've ever accidentally hit that button on your keyboard that opens up the panel on your web browser that shows you all this mad code, you're like, oh, what have I done? Um, that's that console, that's an HTML, uh, that's the structure. That is the, the back end to the front end. So that's the back front end um, of your web browser. That will be uh, semi-structured data. So it, it resides in a relational database because it does have some structure and um, taggable, essentially. So uh, it's tweets organized by hashtags, emails that are being sorted, you know, your inbox, your sent to your draft and so on. So now we know what data is, or where it came from, we know what data, big data is, we know the types of big data, how do we store the big data? Now there is one omission here in this entire webinar, um, well there's technically two, I'm not going to talk about security because that's a whole webinar in itself, so um, just make sure everything you do is secure. Uh, I would say the mission is the extraction, the means with which you're going to extract the data, because again, that is a webinar in itself. That is um, an IoT or a, um, depends what you're doing, <laughs> um, Google Analytics and so on. So it depends what your application is, but there's many, many, many means of being able to collect data and provide the insights that you're looking for. But again, I'll, I'll kind of come back to that at the very end. So storing the big data, what, where do, you, where do you put it? Um, there are three main places. There's the database, data warehouse, and a data lake. But, well, the database is, mine never looks like that. <laughs> um, but that's the prettified version of um, an SQL or a, a, a lovely structured relational database. Um, now I have MySQL in here as an example. Uh, because many people use MySQL. If you're going to use a database of some sort that is a relational database, I prefer you use MariaDB only because MariaDB is the open source version of my SQL. And it is an exact replica of MySQL um, because it's made by the same guys who made MySQL. But they then I think it was originally open source and then MySQL or MySQL, I keep interchanging it because I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it, um, made it more vendor locked in and they did not like that. So they left and copied everything. So it looks exactly like my MySQL. And the thing is they couldn't, uh, MySQL could not um, sue them because it was those guys who had the IP. <laughs> so anyway, um, other examples are, uh, so MySQL and MariaDB would be the traditional relational ACID compliant um, structured database. The non-relational databases would be the likes of InfluxDB. So that would be a time series database, one I'd be most familiar with, in fact. Um, so that would be the one I would use for collecting streaming data, real-time data, data coming off machines or assets. Um, anything that would have a timestamp associated with it. PostgreSQL uh, would be the next biggest one. And it would be an, an all, all, all enhanced, all encompassing style database that can take your time series, it can take your relational and non-relational and blobs and, and so on. Uh, very powerful, very useful, uh, very popular. Similarly with HBase, Couchbase, Cassandra, they're popular as well for um, different reasons. So some of them are um, column-based and uh, some of them are oh, group-based. I've forgotten the differences between them all. I don't, I've, I've, I've never used those three. Um, I would probably be tempted to use Cassandra at some point, just out of curiosity. MongoDB is something that, um, I was excited to start to use until they changed their open source license uh, to make it um, less open and um, out of principle, I uh, will not use it. So there we go. Um, if anyone has any interest in open source, uh, Flax and Teal, myself, um, Jillian, were uh, all open source advocates. And there is a um, 
blog, Belfast Linux User Group Meetup on meetups.com, which happens every month that um, will um, bring in lots of open source fans for get togethers from various different talks, tech talks, and just socializing because we don't get out much, you see. So, and there's enough. <laughs> Uh, there's another image uh, for those who prefer images um, of comparison between a SQL database and a NoSQL database, i.e. a relational versus a, a non-relational or no relation uh, database. So they have documents. That was the one, not group document, was what I was thinking of. Um, column key value uh, graph. So graph is a really interesting one. I um, It's very useful for the likes of Arches, which is a, a heritage sector cataloging database so you have in your uh imagination i am ima i imagine in your imagination uh, when you think of databases you probably think of if you open windows explorer and you have your files and your subfiles and your parent your parent child folders um your ability to search so if you wanted to find what is the connection between um china and india when it comes to numerical analysis You've already covered that here this morning. Um, you're welcome. Uh, but it's hard to do that within a folder structure such as that. With a graph folder, you have these nodes which show you the relationships between different documents, different um, pieces of information. And it's really useful for the likes of cataloging. So if you have, um, say, for example, I'm working with a company recently who were considering um, architecture documents and I was thinking about the L LPS land property services and the uh, ordinance surveys and solicitors and uh, planning permission and so on and so forth. That the address could be the main node and the relationships between oh, um, relationships between solicitors could be there along with the um, ordinance survey requests and and so on and so forth. It's a really interesting way of being able to present data and visualize it. But that is an example of a non-relational database. <clears throat> so what is a data, data warehouse? Well, data warehouse is a structured style um, framework that you would use a database to push data into a data warehouse. Now, it could be that your database resides inside a data warehouse. But either way, in order to do any kind of staging, reporting, and data analysis, and so on, you have to have some form of um, structure. Hence, why this data warehouse image has—I can only presume—but um, <clears throat> of course, to assume makes it pass with you me. So you have here the typical symbol of a database is this symbol here, and I'm not quite sure what these are meant to be. I think stacks and tiers and layers of different things the database does. This data warehouse is emulating a database because it does other things other than just store data, but it needs to be in a structured structured manner. So you may have heard of Snowflake or Google BigQuery or um, Synapse Analytics. You may not have, I don't know, but um, there are many out there. Um, Amazon Redshift would be a big one and Google BigQuery. Snowflake is very popular. So Data Lake then, what the heck? Um, so Data Lake is your repository for all things random. It's your, your main centralized repository. So you don't have to use a data warehouse, you can use a data lake, and you can get the this sort of um, insights from your data lake. So it would be the one that I have more familiarity with, uh, mainly because I kind of like to cut out the middleman, to be quite honest. It's easier just to have fewer steps in between. Um, so any work that I have done previously, outside of Lintel anyway, has been take data from sensor or find a, a, a method of, of data collection, apply it, gather the data, whatever data that may be, into one massive repository, one globule of something, what I call the data lake, um, apply cleaning, processing, and visualize. And that cleaning and processing um, could also include steps such as machine learning and AI. Um, which I have done. So then you have your your um, your outcomes from that, your business insights, and then you go back to square one again because once you have your business insights, you're like, oh, cool! I didn't know this was a thing that I should be looking at. So then you find more ways of being able to apply um, data collection methods and tools to this particular area to help 
um, shed light on your blind spot of your company. So your, your data lake can take structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. Now there is, there's one more, and that's a data lake house. Now, this is a, a new-ish thing. Um, so it's a, hold on, I'm going to refresh my notes here. Probably should be doing that the entire time, but um, a data lake house is a new open data management architecture that combines the flexibility, cost efficiency, and scale of data lakes with the data management and asset transactions of data warehouse. Is enabling business intelligence and machine learning on all data. So when I said before about how data lake, that tended to be the route I always went down. Turns out I was really looking, I was really implementing a data lake house without even knowing it. So by, by putting together this big data webinar, I've learned something today. <laughs> um, I did not know a data lake house was a thing. And in fact, um, I probably shouldn't be saying this. I probably just said I knew all these things and this is amazing and um, I'm amazing and all, but uh, uh, it's not true. Um, data lake house architecture includes uh, ETL, which is extract, transform, load. That is pretty much what, a, what Lintel does. It takes the data coming in and a user intuitive way is able to apply processors to that data, select the one that you want. It does all this fancy work and then pops out a report at the end and is able to tell you, hey, row 172 in column A, B, B is an invalid number, I don't know, whatever it is you're, you're trying to do, um, or the sentiment analysis in this Hansard is um, negative. Um, so Data Lake House, that is another one. I'm going backwards now. Um, so here we go, back to interactivity. Because the next stage is handling data. So we've got the history of data, and what it is, what big data is, how you store or methods of storing big data and what types of big data are, what in your organization and in your personal life, if that's the sort of thing you do, um, how do you, sorry, I have to go through this annoying thing here. Yeah. What tools do you use to process data? If you got um, a ring of data coming in from a sensor or from um, Google Analytics or something, and you had a CSV file or an um, XML file or a Word document, I don't know, um, what, what way would you process that data? What tools would you use? And I'll give you I'll have a look at the chats here while you fill that, uh, fill that in. Sorry, Steph, I didn't realize you were having issues there as well with um, Slido. Uh, thank you, Julian, for the link to the security. Yes. My pleasure. I think they run free two hour sessions as well. I'm just messaging Simon. Okay. Um, so, Excel, that's what I expected. <laughs> that's what I expected. Um, yeah, it's pretty popular. Pretty popular. The problem with Excel, particularly when it comes to um, handling big data, is that it crashes. <laughs> a lot and it may take forever to open. So if you've ever had or come across data sets that are a million or more rows, you, you're, you, are, you won't be able to open it. So um, it's, uh, it's there's quite a number of data sets in Open Data and I um, and also National Statistics and so on that it, it just won't open in Excel. So if you think you have big data, but you can open it in Excel, you are mistaken. <laughs> Um, good alternatives to my Excel, interesting alternatives to my Excel uh, would be, I'm a big fan of Python, so I enjoy Jupyter Notebook. Now, it is not as user intuitive as Microsoft Excel for those who know how to use Microsoft Excel. And I do question, does anyone know how to actually use Microsoft Excel to the fullest of its capabilities? 
I mean, there's some amazing apps and, and capabilities within Excel, but I have rarely used any of them. And I thought I was quite proficient. <laughs> Turns out I, I really wasn't. I, know I, definitely, I definitely don't because um, Martin um, always says that I need to get my European, whatever it is, driving license, my um, Excel qualification because uh, there's so much stuff I just so much yeah I mean there's fantastic other visualization capability you know it, it has um a, it competes with power bi <laughs> in its ability to present information um it is incredible it's just um I'm a fan of Jibber notebook so um so I'm not going to get into the tools to use for handling data, I would say that the two popular ones would be if you're non-academic, if you're academic, MATLAB is usually in there because they're paid for the license and they just try to make people use it. Um, and it's kind of good for signal processing uh, because it has particular apps. But anyway, um, Python, which is inherent in the use of Jupyter Notebook, is excellent for mathematical analysis um for visualization of the data and um there is so many different styles uh and libraries and packages that you can use to get the most out of your data and analyze your data uh r would be the other one which is a statistical analysis tool that you can use in combination with python and indeed in Jupyter notebook you can you have the option of using either one so um i would explore those op options. Uh, I appreciate that it does require you learning a language, um, but it's only on a very, very, very basic um, means whenever you're doing data analysis. Um, and there's so many different uh, YouTube videos and um, medium out, media out there for you to um, review. So data visualization. So you'd be glad to know we're coming to the end, Julian. Data visualization. Um, many people may use Power BI. So once you've got all this data coming in and you've done some analysis, how do you get the insights on a, on a, in an easy manner? How do you portray that information and disseminate it to those of of, uh, who are interested? Power BI, Tableau, and Amazon QuickSight are three popular means of data visualization. Open source alternatives, um, Grafana, big one for me. I really, really like using Grafana. Um, it's something that um, never ceases to amaze me <laughs> with what it can do. Uh, and because I like it so much, you got two slides. Um, Plotly Dash, recent development, well, I say recent in the last, say, five years development, um, maybe seven, but yeah, it's a fantastic uh, dashboard and means of, of visualization with so many um, beautiful <laughs> templates and the, uh, infographic templates. <clears throat> the downside is that you do have to kind of, it's almost like LaTeX where you have to create it yourself um, via coding and scripting. Weave, another one, uh, another pretty one. And it is, I'm not using the word pretty, but there you go. Uh, it's one that is an open source one as well as Apache Superset which probably is your biggest competitor to um, uh, Power BI and Tableau. Metabase is a new one to me anyway, uh, but it's growing in popularity. And then Databricks Red Dash is another one. Uh, oh, and Kerbal, Node Red Dashboard, another one that I've used. Uh, it does live, as does Gravana, it does live data streaming, but it can also just provide static information, provide images on there. You can stream camera footage on it, and um, you can talk. You can interact with it, turn off sensors, or turn machines on or off, or um, interact with whatever device it is that you're using to collect the information from. So, why do you actually care? Why should you care? Uh, so, business case is that it's going to grow with big data market, as you can imagine, with the number of people on Earth and the growing number of uh, connected devices, gathering data, people like yourselves who are interested in um, educating themselves in how to harness the power of big data and get those business insights. It's growing year on year, $103 billion worth by 2027. 
in 2011, <laughs> they um, estimated that if US healthcare were used big data creatively and effectively to drive efficiency and quality, the sector could create more than $300 billion in value every, every year if only the NHS would do such a thing. In the developed economies of Europe, government administrators could save more than 100 billion euros of operational efficiency improvements alone by using big data. Those are the sorts of um, insights that governments are trying to implement, um, trying to, uh, and um, statistics agencies are forecasting what they should be doing to get these revenues. No reason why you can't do it either. Um, uh, so according to Bark Research, so Bark is a, it's an industry analyst and consulting firm for business software with a focus on business intelligence and analytics, data management, enterprise content management, ECM, customer relationship management, CRM, and enterprise resource planning, ERP. So they have done research and have found that 71% um, of people make statistics up on the spot and that 69% um, with big data can create better strategic decisions. 54% can, can improve control of operational processes. There's better understanding of customers and there's massive cost reductions. Why wouldn't you try to harness the um, power uh, of the data? Management is where the decisions are made. Um, not leaders, managers. Uh, so whether or not big data initiatives thrive in companies revolves principally around their management. In companies where big data initiatives are an integrated part of business processes, Senior management is the primary driver or thought leader, 61% um, of which. However, an organization is still considering using big data analysis. So that 61% are the managers, the primary drivers in companies. You're already considering it. Um, you're already using it, sorry. For those who are considering using it, you're not currently implementing it. The management isn't on, it's not that they're not on board, but it's, they're not um, the ones pushing it. And the corresponding figure is about 34%. So business departments still very passive and much less likely to be the drivers behind this topic. But once you do get them behind it, that it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Um, so I'm very, very conscious of time. Big data management canvas. If you want to look at the business, business strategy for big data, uh, this is a, a pretty good um, reference table, you can find a really good paper, which is open source or open access and uh, called Big Data Management Canvas, a reference model for value creation from data. Um, so we can talk you through how you go about kind of um, developing a business strategy, all the things you would need to think about to create value, which is really all you're trying to do from gathering big data. Now, I don't know if you want to do this or not. This is the last one. I believe, uh, yeah, this is the last interactive session. It's essentially just a breakout session for everyone to discuss their, what they may consider as a, um, what they should consider for their business strategy um, moving forward. But I appreciate it's another half 10. I've taken an hour to do this. So if you want to do this, happy to do this. If not, I can summarize just what you would need to consider for your big data framework. Um, it's up to you, Gillian. Um, uh, how are people feeling? Do you want to um, quickly go into breakout rooms or um, yeah, Marguerite saying yeah. I think it would be even for five minutes just to chat. Through. Okay. And because well, the whole point of the digital search program is to help people understand all this. So it wouldn't necessarily be that somebody has to suddenly learn Python and work out how to do all this. We're no. in support to do that. Um, and I know some people will want to do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know. Um, that that's why people are some people are on the program but other people are like i just know i have data and i just want to i, I want somebody to get absolutely to yeah so well. so that'll probably be interesting to discuss in the breakout rooms as well so if you, yeah i'm happy enough to go into them for five minutes or so okay so everybody welcome along ian fleming who is the program manager for um the open data uh and i open data program and I'm just going to make Ian host. There we go. Um, I gave a wee bit of an introduction to Open Data and um, earlier on, Ian. But if please do, um, I, I may, do your own introduction. I think would be best because I don't know if I've done it very well. Okay, I'll I'll just share screen and begin yeah. my presentation and do a bit of background. Yeah. So 
Okay, um, the Open Data Project. Um, it's been running within DOF since about 2015, and it grew out of um, the Open Data Charter that was agreed at the Locker and Summit in 2013 by the G8 countries. Um, the five principles, as you can see there, of making data open data by default, that it should be usable by all. Um, we can release data for better transparency, better governance, and also but their principle five for releasing data for innovation. These were the foundations for what uh, became the first open data strategy that was launched in 2015 on the back of the NA executives agreement um, to adopt the open data principles so that the Northern Ireland civil service departments and wider public sector would seek to um, make their information um, available by default where possible and where complying with information legislation and the likes of that. So um, there's a bit of a timeline for the first, I know it's an old, it's an old slide that covers the period 2013 to 2018, but it's some of the things that um, were achieved during the first version of the Open Data Strategy. Um, so the, the strategy was launched in 2015, it established the Open Data team within DOF, um, and it also led to the creation of the Open Data Portal, um, where we now host uh, our, our data sets. Um, the portal itself was launched in November 2015. This is the most current version. Um, it was updated um, last year. And as you can see along the top, uh, it's where we host the data sets, where we can um, uh, create users so that people within the departments uh, who wish to publish their data sets onto the portal can do so. Um, And also allows us then to have an area for showcases where we've asked people to um, post up projects that they've done using the data that's hosted as an open data NI. And also we have a new section created there, which doesn't have any information in it at the moment, but soon will for the innovation and outreach funds that have been taking place over the last couple of years. Um, and I'll talk more about the innovation projects uh, as, we, as we go on. Okay, so the information then that's published on the Open Data Portal goes up under an open government license. So essentially that means that um, the information is there and it's free for any type of use from the users of the Open Data Portal. So they're free to download the information and use it as they see fit. Um, they can, yes, they can, as you see there, they can adapt it, they can exploit it, they can combine it, they can create applications from it, and they can um, also uh, exploit it, the information for commercial purposes as well. So the first strategy ran up to um, uh, 2018, and that's when I joined uh, the Open Data team, and it was to rewrite the strategy and um, have a look at what had been achieved in the first sort of three years of the project, and looking forward what we could do to um, better the situation with regards to the publication of data. In the first um, three years of the project, uh, roughly 400, 300 to 400 data sets had been published from across the Northern Ireland Civil Service and the wider public sector. And also um, we had begun a process of training staff across the departments as well um, to sort of widen knowledge of the theories behind open data and um, what were the benefits of it and what were the possibilities behind it. But um, by 2018, yeah, the decision was made that we should have a look and um, redraft the strategy and see how that would um, help accelerate, the, for, what, for instance, the publication of data. So as you see there, the first, the first sort of main theme is that is the increase in the publication from the from the from government. Um, also, we decided that yeah, if we could promote sort of the entrepreneurial side of open data, showing how innovation. Uh, and the use of data would be an advocate for its benefits. Um, and to date, since 2019, 2020, year on year, we've run an open data innovation and outreach fund, which I'll talk about in a moment or two. Um, we've been, well, initially we, we, we saw 2020, 2021 as the years where we would go out on the road and um, share the benefits of open data to staff across the, the, the Northern Ireland Civil Service and wider public sector to um, 
try and convince them to release their data. Um, I think one of the problems that we face uh, in our team uh, with civil servants is that the, the, the risk culture of, of, of the Northern Ireland public sector. Um, uh, and you would get a lot of questions of, well, why do you need this data? And what we're talking about is like transactional data, reporting data um, that has been created as part of their work. So, you know, we're trying to explain the benefits behind publishing that data, but um, that could prove problematic. So the idea was that we would go on the road, speak to information asset owners in the departments, go to their information asset owner forums, go to departmental boards and um, sort of bang the drum for the project. But unfortunately, well, we all know what happened in 2020. And um, we were, um, as you can see now, I'm at home. Uh, we were um, reduced to working from home and the sort of the prospects of getting around and about and speaking to people sort of um, went off the radar. Um, and then the final, the, the, the final uh, sort of theme for the strategy was that one about training, um, to training staff. So one of the things we did do during the lockdown period was work with the, the Open Data Foundation to create an online training resource, which is now available on um, the civil services learning platform links. Uh, it was an introduction to open data training course and also a deeper dive open data training course designed for information asset owners and that has been on running for just over a year now and hope, uh, to date I think several hundred staff have taken the, the advantage or taken the, the opportunity of um, looking at that information or looking at information on that training course. Okay, so yes, the, 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 the sort of main theme, you know, was this idea of accelerating publication. And in the past, um, we had sort of this circular conversation with open data advocates, you know, saying, publish stuff and we're going, well, what do you want? And um, they come back and say, well, what do you have? And yeah, at that stage, we, we weren't entirely sure, you know, um, we had an idea of, of our, in our own department, but across the NICS, well, the picture was somewhat less clear. And with the advent of GDPR and the need for information asset registers, um, we saw this as an opportunity um, for identifying information in the departments. So one of the first things that we asked in the Open Data Strategy, the current version, was that the departments would publish their information asset registers as open data sets onto the Open Data Portal. And then we ourselves and the Open Data team would use those um, documents to uh, identify potential sources of information in each department that could be published as uh, uh, an open data set onto Open Data NI. Um, and there you see the targets, the ideas we had for the three years of the strategy, so that by year um, three of the strategy, at least, you know, over half of the information asset register should be published as um, open data sets onto the portal. Um, I suppose with that sort of two-year period where we were we were kind of locked down, um, we haven't got to that sort of stage yet. Um, to date, we have published, uh, as you can see there, 705 data sets on, onto the Open Data Portal. Um, as I say, they come from every department, uh, from some local councils, from other arm's length public bodies and non-departmental public bodies. And they cover a wide range of uh, information from, as I say, transactional sort of reporting data through to GIS information. Um, there's about 2000 versions of those data sets being published so far from 80 publishers and those, yeah, data downloads is, um, we, we, we run Google Analytics on um, the Open Data Portal just to see where our users come from, the number of users that we have, and um, there have been 44,000 downloads of the information um, used that we have hosted on Open Data NI. Now, there may be may have been 44,000 downloads, but <laughs> one of the sort of things that we I suppose we have to look at um, is we don't have a, a picture of what people are doing who are downloading the data. When we launched the portal, we asked people to put up the showcases and show us some of the projects or ideas that they've had with the data. And I think we have 22, 23 showcases 
on on the portal um showing off what people have done but um obviously there's more being done but we just haven't we haven't had a chance to, to see what that actually is and there you have the most popular data sets by download um and almost from the start the gp prescribing data is is the the most popular data set it's the data set that has been um there since launch and every month it is updated and it is the one that's the most downloaded the most um uh, looked at by users of the, the portal and as you can see there's a sort of a wide variety of information there that is uh, that, that, that is being looked at um by our users okay so promote, promoting innovation um this idea that if we showed um what could be done with the data other than for what it has been created um, then we could use that as a sort of advocacy tool when we go out there and speak to people uh, trying to get them to to publish their data so um we came up with this idea of doing open data innovation and outreach fund um in the first life of the open data project we ran two competitions and i th I think uh, the first competition you see there, the Open Data uh, NA Challenge, the Education Challenge one, um, we put up a sum of money uh, seeking um, education themed um, applications that could be used and um, put up a sum of £20,000 for local sort of tech community uh, organisations to come up with, uh, yes, as I say, an application. And I do think that. Project Lintel, uh, or some of the guys from Flax and Teal were one of the winners. They created um, a, a sort of visualization tool called My Raging Planet, which using data sources on Open Data and I were able to model the effects of a um, natural disaster on uh, an area of Northern Ireland. Um, and that tool, you know, it, it's, they have adapted it since and actually in, in, in one of the first um, rounds of the Open Data and Innovation Fund, they adapted uh, My Raging Planet with further information um, to show what could be done. Uh, the other the other winner was uh, a local company which produced um, a tool teaching uh, A-level kids how to code in SQL using open data sources and open data ANI. And the other uh, project uh, competition we ran was the Make It Challenge. We came to schools where we uh, asked schools to come up with some uh, idea, data visualizations using um, uh, open data sources and open data ANI. And I, six or seven schools eventually ended up winning a um, thousand pounds each uh, on the back of that project. So, um, we decided to develop that further and we come up with the Open Data Innovation and Outreach Fund, uh, which is run each year of this version of the strategy, the 2020 to 2023 strategy. The current version has just ended, so we'll be expecting um, final reports from the winners. But um, so what we do, we've made available um, £30,000 uh, aimed at students, data analysts, data scientists, local company, tech companies, um, to come up with um, projects that show, could show innovation in the use of data and open data NI, or to host outreach events um, promoting the use of open data NI. And in the years that we've been running, we've awarded uh, money to um, both types of um, those projects. So we've hosted hackathons on the back of this fund. We've also seen um, products being applications being produced on the back of the fund and these are the three categories that we're currently running so support innovative use advocacy outreach engagement and then transparency openness and unlocking, unlocking value in the use of data and the awards run from 300 to 5000 pounds and we ask that um the winners then provide us with final reports and what they've done so that we can then um, publicize uh, their projects and um, we'll be seeking to do that over the next few months on the newly updated uh, open data ni portal so those are the current dates and the fund um, so if anybody out there fancies taking part you have four weeks to apply um, 
the application fund details can be found on the Open Data Portal or on our on our Twitter feed, and we will then be announcing winners at the end of March, with projects to be completed by January 2024. Those are our contact details, either the data portal web address, you can get in touch through the data inbox and also keep an eye on latest developments or um, what we're up to on the open data Twitter feed. And that is a rather quick um, <laughs> run through what we're doing at the moment. So thank you. That was great, Ian. Thank you very much. And I've put in a link to um, our Raging Planet in the chat there. Um, Okay. Has anyone any questions? Oh, yes, yeah, so any questions, by all means, yeah. Um, but there's so many da different data sets up there. And, and I know I've done um, hackathons at Belfast City Council and stuff before. And, you know, we were pointing people towards the ones on the, the park, you know, about the parks and there's trees and, you know, there's so many great data sets up there that. Yeah, by all means, just. Um, um, Go to Open Data NI and have a, a, a route around. As I say, we yeah. uh, the, the, they come they come from across the public sector. The data sets that we have published, we would like to publish far more than we actually actually do. Um, but as I say, a sort of combination of um, the last couple of years and the team is actually just me at the moment. <laughs> I've lost my other two colleagues who have gone to other posts and haven't been replaced. So. Um, uh, and and also the, the the classic sort of um, civil servants civil service hesitancy in sharing with that because they're obviously they're the paranoid about what might happen if they release this information. I'm currently working with the departments to publish um, details of the departmental spend because that's one of the trans that's one of the themes in the current open data strategy is to be more transparent and showing how we spend public money. And my colleague Cormac and I. Um, we're looking at what's been done in the GB home civil service departments. And since 2010, they've been publishing their details of departmental spend, including their um, departmental credit cards above £25,000 for each department. So we thought, well, you know, we have to follow suit. <laughs> yeah. But it's proven really difficult to um, get the, our, our colleagues on board with, 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 with that, you know. We um, have a sort of central accounting system called Account NI in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which hosts all this information, and we want to take extracts from that and publish them onto Open Data NI. Account NI said they wouldn't do it because they're data, pro they're data processors, they're not data, they don't own the data. So we had to then go to the departments. So working together with the departments, we set up a project within our own department to publish our own departmental spend. That took nigh on a year to publish essentially a 60 line spreadsheet every month okay so when we went back to the departments which this was uh, back in may last year we still haven't got them on you know we've met with a few in the, the sort of latter half of last year uh, explained the process to them and what they'd have to do and they've been given mocked up data sets from account ni to let them work on them uh, to get them into a position to publish, and they haven't done it. You know, so it's just that you know we can go out and and speak to people, provide all the training material they need from our YouTube channel where we have online videos about how to publish on Open Data and I, and our guidance documentation, and we leave it with them, and we don't hear from them again. You know, so um, I always think information management in the civil service. Um, it's seen as something that's a bit, kind of an add-on to your duties, something to be done maybe on a Friday afternoon if you ever actually get around to it. And that's something that has sort of militated against us, I think, since the foundation. You know, it's all well and good. The GE it's saying we will be more open in publication of data on uh, in the way that government works, but actually making that work, uh, it, it, it can be quite problematic. Yeah. Okay, well, that was brilliant. And that's a really, um, I would really encourage people to have a look at that innovation and outreach fund as well. Um, yes, £30,000. So you can, as I say, you can win up to 5000 depending on which category you go for. Um, you, can use source, you can use sources of information that you already have yourselves, as long as they're combined with sources of data that are on Open Data NI. Has, 
there has to be something from open data and I used in the, in, in, in the application. Um, as I say, uh, I think the closing date is the fourth of, I think it's Friday, the 4th of March. Yeah. Rebecca, you have your hand up? Yeah, um, the, with regards to the use of open data uh, sets and what people have been doing with them, um, might be worth talking to, you may already know him, uh, Joe Rafferty from University of Ulster. So uh, he was, <laughs> was already one of my lecturers. Um, he's in the tech community as well, so it's a bit weird been taught by him. But um, he uh, was one of the pieces of coursework was to take a large data set and derive insights from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously you get signposted to the likes of Kaggle or Open Data NI. Um, a lot of people were taking data sets from Open Data NI and doing some really quite interesting things with it. Uh, and now, I, obviously, they just went into the ether and nothing ever happened with them. But it might be of interest to approach him and that, and even work with him in a sense um, of ensuring you get some interesting outputs from there. So for, I use the GP prescribing data. Um, yeah, it's, and, um, uh, <laughs> we we saw some of those um, visualizations that people. I think some people combined GP prescribing data with causes of death. Yeah, so I was looking at um, depression and suicide. And, yeah, to show the misuse of the yeah. use of medication, yeah. Yeah, um, so it was actually what I found quite interesting was initially I was going to look at gentrification and then I alongside prescription um, and depression and so on. Um, but I ended up getting sucked out a rabbit hole of the cost of um, antidepressants and the difference between SSRIs and S um, SNRIs. And the difference in cost throughout NI by taking the yep. Office of National Statistics postcode data and the GP prescribing data. And um, so there's some really interesting insights you can get from, and you can go off in one tangent and then realize you get caught by something much more interesting and pursue that. And the way of being able to, to just your the open data NI is just such a good resource and it's much better than ISRA, just it's much better than ISRA. Um, well, but we're, 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 we're working with, well, I say we're working, we were working with Nisra when Cormac was on the team. And Cormac, yeah, right, Nisra's, so. the way that they, it's, it's unfriendly to end user Nisra's data sets because they have it formatted in a particular way, so it makes it less easy to process and clean in right, okay, um, yeah. data suites such as um, R or um, different, different notebooks and so on, whereas yours come as your state there's the CSV file. Yes, but it's, it's a minimum, it's minimum CSV. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean it's brilliant to work with. Um, um yeah, no, I'm a very much big fan of that NI. <laughs> yeah, Nizra currently working uh, on a project um to replace Ninus. And um they currently call it table builder. And I think the, the what they will eventually have when it's released is the same as what the Central Statistics Office has down south. And we're planning then, as our Irish Open Data colleagues have done, to build a harvest process. So mm. without, we'll be running an automated process from whatever appears in the near future. Um, and once it's updated, that will be pulled across onto Open, open Data NI. As, uh, yeah. Because I, I think there was there was overlap between the two. So some of the data sets I was looking at on Nizra, I was like, right, you know what, I'm going to try and find it on Open Data NI. And it was mm. there and it's much nicer to use. So yeah. Yes, um, Anyway, I'll just show you. Brilliant. Uh, Ian, thank you very much. Um, uh, it was a really um, good because I think it's, it has, as Rebecca says, it's such a great resource and that is a really great um, fund as well. Um, would you mind making me host okay. again? Um, um, I did sort of promise everybody a big break, um, but you're not going to get it because um, um, we've got James up next, who I was calling Jason yesterday, which is an, an anagram of his name but um still wasn't wasn't close you know, <laughs> close but no cigar mm. um okay so i am going to make you host so uh ian thank you uh thank you very much no um, and i'll share Ian's slides as well but over to james and james i gave a very quick introduction to you way 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 at the beginning but um certainly do um do another introduction to yourself yeah i just want to make sure um zoom doesn't like me um the feeling is mutual to be perfectly honest uh, so i'm just gonna make sure i share the right screen 
No, that's the wrong one. How do I go Legacy back? Faster urban innovation framework, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I've shared the wrong. Um, right. Do, do, do. I think. I don't know what I'm sharing now. Am I sharing oh, anything? Yeah, you're sharing like a presentation. Oh, right, um, okay. That's good. Yeah, it just doesn't seem to be showing up for me. I'm not sharing show. my notes screen or anything, just the normal presentation. Uh, no, you need to go up to start slideshow or view slideshow. Oh. Whenever you share a screen, it takes you to that specific screen and um, it doesn't have, as other apps have, a green line around or border. I think you just, you have no idea whether people are seeing what you're, what you're looking at. <laughs> um, right. So interact with it as so you... Slides. Yeah, go to slideshow and start show. Oh, right, okay. Oops, because I did have the slideshow. Is that, is that better? Yes, 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 yes. Finally, we'll get there. Yeah, so I'm from the Smart Belfast team and clearly not that smart. Um, so yeah, I'm James Noakes. I'm an innovation broker at um, Belfast City Council in our city innovation office. Um, we effectively work on the Smart Belfast programme for the city. So we're based in the city council. Um, but we work with a range of different stakeholders across cities. Just a bit about my background, uh, but working on kind of smart city challenges for a few years. Um, I used to be, for my sins, a politician in in Liverpool. I always point out that I decided to give up politics. So I decided to leave Liverpool and come somewhere where the politics was less contentious. Uh, I find myself in Belfast. Um, but my background, a lot of my background is around um uh, supporting innovation especially around uh environment climate change and, and uh issues such as that so that's a bit about about me um so yeah when we look at i'm going to talk about our urban innovation framework when we look at urban innovation um what are we talking about so we're basically looking at how we can take digital technologies and we're kind of fairly technology agnostic so it's kind of what best suits and how can we deploy that in the city to to address some of our key urban challenges and those urban challenges you know they're set out in a range of different strategic documents for the for the city and for northern ireland um so it's around the the economy around health mobility etc lots of different areas that um we try and uh, apply uh, to that we're also responsible for a city deal the digital element of city deal um which is that uh, a funding pot essentially that's been provided through central government down to northern down to Belfast city region level and we're taking forward a number of different projects which I'll probably touch upon uh in a little bit as well so uh we've actually been around since I think it's around 2017 maybe a little bit earlier I didn't join until 2019 um but there's a range of different things that we've uh we've provided I'll I'll make sure that we get the slides so that you can um, uh, you can look at these at your leisure rather than trying to see everything all at once. But yeah, there's a range of different things that we've delivered uh, around um, Belfast. So uh, I'll touch upon some of those different things. So um, yeah, we've we, we've supported kind of how we use technology to support tourism, for instance, which is obviously very important for Belfast. And there's other work that we're ongoing, which again, I'll touch upon a little bit later um, around supporting that element. How can we take technologies and support it? Um, uh, so some of this is delivered not by ourselves, but by other people, a lot by the private sector as well, and where we help facilitate uh, and support uh, a, a lot of that um there's things like last mile delivery which we've we've worked on it's a real challenge the the way that cities work has changed over time so these days um people may not necessarily go to the shops themselves but they'll look at um but the, that reduction in in traffic for instance is then taken up by a range of different vans etc and it's always that last mile actually a lot of the delivery companies find it really difficult that, that last mile um in order to uh to get their deliveries on time so we look at kind of better ways of of managing that and different approaches to doing that we also look at how can we get people out into our out into our parks um and how can we get uh, people so that's specific dollars that, that, that example there 
uh, how can we get people uh, engaged, but also how can we address antisocial behavior uh, and the like. So we use different technologies for different approaches. Um, there's one of the things that we've recently just been involved in is that healthy aging. And we worked with the markets development, uh, I never get it right. It's the, is it the markets development association? It's the, basically the residential um, uh, body for the markets area close to the, well, they're in the city center. And can, how can we engage uh, people there? We're working with Queen's University on that to improve uh, their experience of uh, of living at home. I mean, clearly we want to keep people in their own homes rather than having to go into care, et cetera. And how can we use technology that helps support them? And uh, that's a good example of how we tend to work. We work a lot around co-design um, and work with uh, the people who it's going to most affect so they can inform us and we can develop it so it really works uh, for them. So that's just a few examples of some of the things that we've done. Um, in December, we recently um, went through council with our urban innovation framework, which kind of sets our agenda for the next few years. What are the kind of things that we're going to be looking at? How are we going to deliver it? What kind of partners that we're gonna, gonna work with? And there's a number of different things where we've highlighted that we'll have a focus, um, but then we'll also, uh, the kind of challenges that we're really trying to to address um, <clears throat> and where will we have the most impact uh, with that so there are kind of specific areas where we want to, to to focus so that transition to net zero is a key part uh, of this you know the city has its own commitments but at the same time we've got to make sure that we realize some of the opportunities that are around that and we believe that digital plays a big part of that. I'm not going to go through all of these, I'll just point out a few different things. You may be aware of Belfast Stories, um, which is in the old Bank of Ireland building. It's a proposal uh, uh, to build a new kind of visitor uh, centre, tourist attraction, uh, film archive, lots of different kind of cultural entities. Uh, and, uh, and we've been working with them and how can we make best use of, of digital and improve connectivity um, so that it's not just within the building itself but actually out onto the street etc so you know we look at things like augmented reality uh, and the like and is there a role that we can use digital in order to collect some of those stories about the city as well so that before they're presented um yeah and then we're obviously looking at some of the city's own operations so we were we're now beginning to look a bit more internally how can we support that service change so it makes better use of of digital operation that could be something quite simple i mean when i was in liverpool developed um an approach where you could ask alexa when to put your bins out and actually that's just you know it's a small little thing but actually quite a lot of people uh really benefited from that and um, it's a way sometimes of addressing uh some of the social exclusion problems people have you know uh, um using technology so we can overcome some of those barriers so people what we what i have found in the past is that sometimes if people they're not able to to read, I mean, some places the literacy rate is quite is quite low, um, but they're able to speak. And if you can help them set up, you know, a voice device, etc., you can maybe over help them overcome some of those some of those barriers that they face in accessing services. So it's just kind of one example. There, now a key focus of what we're looking at is the uh, is what we call a smart district. We looked around the world and we'd seen in lots of different places that there is. Uh, a lot of benefit in targeting a specific location in order to trial and test different approaches, which you can then scale out. So whilst Belfast is a fairly small enough city uh, compared to a lot of other places, you know, it's small enough, uh, it's big enough to, to matter, but it's small enough to get things done. Even at that scale, it's kind of quite difficult. And obviously there are inherent uh, challenges that we face in Belfast and engage in different uh, communities as well but if you look at what were the, I mean worth pointing out there's no hard borders when it comes to our smart district so you know if the project needs it so you see the Queens it's kind of outside the, the the line but actually you know if the project needs it and then you know we'll extend out and that goes for a lot of the other areas as well but within that you've got actually different communities so you have your retail commerce industry but you've also got different types of residential community and you've got long established ones you've got newer ones which are kind of more the city centre living that people talk about these days. And then you've got a transient population in students, uh, et cetera. So there's lots of different uh, reasons why we'd 
focus on that and that this slide just kind of sets out a lot of the uh, the corporates and others that uh, and the different schemes that are ongoing to 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 kind of demonstrate there's a, basically a lot of activity uh, that goes on there but what, what will it mean in practice um well and again i'm not going to go through all of this but a couple of things i'd point out to to people on this call um you know it'd be a place where we're trying to improve connectivity i've spent the last two years essentially working on how do we improve the rollout of 5g within belfast because whilst we've got a very good story to tell when it comes to fixed connectivity actually belfast doesn't have a too great a story to tell when it comes to wireless connectivity you know you still get your 4g uh, not spots uh, as you walk around the city, uh, 5G is a whole different level of complexity in terms of how it needs to be rolled out, uh, the access permissions, etc. So even if you walk down Great Victoria Street and you get 5G on your phone, it's pretty much similar to um, to 4G at the moment in order to get the, the benefits that come from that improved connectivity. So that's kind of lower latency, faster speeds, bigger capacity, then uh, there needs to be a lot more infrastructure deployed. Uh, and that's a real challenge for us. But if we can crack it in this area, then we should be able to crack it for everywhere else. Uh, there is some challenge funding um, that's available, and we'll be bringing that, uh, a lot of that forward. Some of it will be brought forward fairly soon. Uh, that is to kind of send out to, to, to different industries, you know, here's the challenge, here's some funding, how would you address it? And it will be around a lot of digital technologies, but... Um, yeah, there's going to be scope in there to, to try and include as, as many different uh, ways of addressing challenges as possible. So, yeah, so uh, as I say, I'll share these slides so you will not go through everything that's on there. Um, there are some projects that are already underway. I've mentioned the Homes for Healthy Aging testbed that we uh, took part in, but there's the stuff around the Maritime uh, Mile, kind of Titanic Quarter around there. Um, and that's a European project that we're involved in. You know, how can we... Uh, transform uh, that area using digital technologies and how can we become more entrepreneurial uh, and that I say that project is ongoing probably a lot more going to be talked about uh, in the very near future around that I'll just pick out the one which is the urban mobility pilot so we were looking at how can we work with people like Amazon Web Services um, which is a backbone for an awful lot of, of, of digital these days uh, around using uh, their, their skills and approaches uh, to address some smaller mobility challenges. And then at the same time, we're also in discussions with TransLink about how do we uh, take advantage of the new transport hub that's being developed and improve connectivity around there and how does, can that support mobility beyond the, the footprint of the transport hub itself. Uh, there's also uh, work on going around an economic analyzer tool. So how can we take a lot of the data we've already got out there analyze it to get a better snapshot uh an understanding of the of the Belfast economy I'm going to try and race through the next uh, a couple because I'm conscious of of time and I could probably rub it on all day and I don't think you want to you want that but there's a couple of things that we are uh looking at um so yeah we're looking at how we can provide better access for SMEs and others to to access finance the urban data platform is an approach where we're looking at and saying how can we bring a lot of disparate data sets that exist around the city uh, to provide better insights uh, we are developing at the moment the citizen opportunities for digital innovation which is uh, a program where we recognize that we can't just do things to people uh, we need to engage them as i said that co-design process but at the same time they need to support to understand the impact of some of these digital technologies both good and bad uh, and get their heads around that so that's something that we're developing at the moment, the Augmented City program, you'll hear about that a lot more in the next in, in the forthcoming months. Uh, at, at present, we're looking at how can you use augmented reality to tell a different story uh, within the city hall. So you've got the exhibition in City Hall, and we use that as a basis, and then it'll extend out from there. So how can you use augmented reality to tell a different tale about that? So you may be able to stand outside City Hall uh, and you can use augmented reality on your phone to see different statues. Uh, around um, and you know learn a bit more about that so it's kind of how can you get it more interactive uh, and as I've already mentioned about the advanced wireless connectivity although that faces a challenge at a Northern Ireland level there's currently little work done uh, Northern Ireland level up specifically on 5G um, so there's a real challenge for the, for the whole of the uh, of Northern Ireland around that um, the innovation challenge funds I, I assure you that I'm coming to the end um, the innovation challenge funds I've, I've touched upon that 
but there's a there's a couple of different areas of that there's some that's going to be around uh, social challenges um you know it could be mobility could be a net zero uh, health a range of different uh challenges around that um and it'll be a mixture of kind of providing it says there are risk finance and some grants as well uh there'll be um sbri uh, programs as well which some people may be uh, used to seeing uh there will be a, a venture fund that's that's developed as part of those challenge funds which will be trying to uh, provide investment for for key smes and, and startups uh in the in the city region uh to support them and kind of um provide finance that's not otherwise available but that uh you'd be glad to know is me at the end i hope i've covered everything there's uh couple of QRs there if you want to take details but yeah smartbelfast.city is uh where to look at and uh yeah and there's my contact details as well uh and that's that's me thanks very much I realize there's a lot in the chat but I've not been able to see that so yeah yeah um I was just I, I put in the chat civic saving from civic dollars spoke at one of our webinars a yeah. few months ago and I think I recorded it and it's on our YouTube and yellow design michael mcglead i think he's doing the some of the ar stuff down at the titanic quarter the, mm -hmm. um, yeah, no. stuff. so just yeah so if yeah, people want to hear a, about some stuff that... we've got a meeting actually got a meeting this afternoon with michael so oh he's lovely he was brilliant he's, he, he, the stuff he's doing is really really interesting so um yeah if you're interested in that side of things do check out one of our he but Stephen from Civic Dollars spoke at one of the blockchain webinars and mm. Michael spoke at one of the AR ones, but some of the stuff he's doing, is, uh, both of them are doing, uh, is fantastic. Um, just, you know this SBRI challenges in the funds, so they're open to companies based in Northern Ireland, you don't have to be based in Belfast for those yeah, yeah, they're yeah. not announced. Yeah. It's generally your Northern Irish, rather, or mm. from Northern Ireland, sorry, um, rather than, um, you don't have to be based in Belfast no, no. region. No. To, yeah cool um has anyone any other uh questions for for james um marguerite there yeah james i'm just um worried about 5g because there's an awful lot out and about around northern ireland about how um it can damage people's um blood systems of children and stuff what, what way would you have of selling that to people who aren't for that? Yeah, we we recognise that people have these health concerns, but we take our advice from um, from the public health uh, people. And um, the research so far demonstrates that there's no real difference in terms of uh, health impacts than, than what we've got already to a certain degree. The, we there is something around um, the health impacts that come from uh, electromagnetic waves, etc. Um, and but that, how can I put it? Um, whilst it says it's, I think it says it's possibly carcinogenic, but that's in the sense that you know it's not as carcinogenic as eating bacon. Um, so you kind of got to understand that the. There are risk elements for virtually everything out there. And in terms of the research around 5G and health impacts, all the advice is that it's not uh, something that we're concerned about. Um, and, but, you know, I accept there's a lot of people out there who will pass around different stories that they claim about 5G. Uh, nothing been provable so far. Okay, it's just some data studies, you know, that haven't shown it to be too good around children. And I think a lot of people in Belfast are very, very concerned about that. You know, if if it is safe, people really need to know it's safe and what the studies are. I just, I'm just thinking that's speaking out loud. We regularly provide... Um... Well, my colleague uh, in our team has regularly provided responses to people who've written in about concerns and kind of pointed them to, to the data and the advice that we get from um, from public health uh, officials and who have looked at the different studies and all the advice still points towards that it's not a concern. 
And there are a lot of other things that are out there that are probably much more concerning to, to people. Okay. Uh, but, but listen, there are there, there have been 5G trials around the country, around the UK. You know, where I lived in Liverpool, there was 5G on the streets around there. There's been no noticeable impact on people's health. And certainly here, James, if you want to as well share with me whoever your colleague is that um, Marguerite can contact, you know, with concerns or, you know, to get the, the data, sure, um, I can share that with Marguerite as well. But yeah, no, okay. I know there's a lot of um, different theories about, but yeah. Um, there's the research, you know, to, to, to show that it's safe and I'm sure the council wouldn't be rolling it out if, if they had any doubts that it would be but Margaret no absolutely you're right to raise it because that is your sort of that's the area you're interested in you know um as well so um has anyone any other questions for James James can you make me host again please Sorry. Uh, oh, you're okay I, I always forget I need to figure out how I do that um so if you go to my the box that I'm in and click on the top right there's a wee blue yeah. We blue, uh, we blue, yeah, thank you. Oh, super, thank you. Okay. Um, so I will share Ian's presentation and contact details, um, James's and Rebecca's as well. Um, but I am very quickly going to share my screen and uh, just very quickly, I've asked in the, um, you can see all my Canvas stuff now here, uh, I'm going to very, I, I put in the chat there about, um, sorry, just trying to get this to present. Oh, you'll just have to look at all of it. Um, I've asked for feedback um, in the chat channel. It takes two seconds to fill it, well, two minutes to fill out the form. It's just, we're really keen to hear your feedback and also invest in I and the council's um, like as much um, evidence that this has actually taken place as well. So um, some other, uh, if you're already on, if you've applied for the digital search program, that's fantastic. It's a, for any company in Northern Ireland from any sector with under 50 employees. If you apply for the program and get on it, there are very few places left, but you get six days of fully funded mentoring in big data, um, AI, IoT, robotics, robotics, immersive technologies, blockchain. And um, but anyone is very welcome to come along to our master classes and webinars um, there are only a few left um, Charlie is running two more um, innovation sessions and they're mandatory part of the programs but are open for anybody with blockchain next week have some great speakers for that robotics and robotics on the 15th IOT on the 22nd and AI in the first and augmented virtual reality will be our last one on the 8th of March but I do try and record them so if you miss them they'll be there I'm racing through this I know um some other things that are going on this evening there is a uh, uh, Harani which is the health innovation research alliance so anything about connected health or um uh, um uh, health um, and life sciences basically but there, there's a meetup this evening <coughs> I think it's in um, I'll share this um, these links uh, Women Who Code are hoping uh, hosting um, I think it's I'm, I'm assuming it's uh, it's remote because it's the Women Who Code Global um, consuming and contributing to open data um, I think it's with Boeing that is on the 9th of February Big Data Belfast is a big conference that happens. It's around May time. It's not announced yet what dates it'll be this year. And Rebecca mentioned the blog meetup as well. Um, I am going to share that in the chat. Um, there you go. All the links are there. And then there's also an IoT um, meetup in Belfast and an AI meetup in Belfast. But if you um, search meetup, you'll find them. We're really, really lucky in Northern Ireland that um, that we've so many meetup groups um, and a really, really great tech community. So um, I'd encourage you to, to investigate that, go on to meet up and see what there is. Um, I, I think that, that is all. Absolutely second yes, that. No. The tech community in, in Rosanna is fantastic. And um, 
once you get to know people, you can't move for finding somebody who's involved in the tech community in some way, shape or form, who can then connect you with somebody else in the tech community who happens to know the answer to the question that you may have. So um, it's worthwhile going to some of those meetups um, for sure. Yeah. And also, um, I know that we've mentioned cybersecurity on this. Um, NI Cyber uh, is running. It's um, a breakfast club but so it's the last friday no it's not it's the last thursday of every month the first one is the 23rd of february and um, it's really for anybody who's working in cyber security or interested in cyber security it's a free um you get a free breakfast basically uh, the first one's at ACIT um on the 23rd of february i will if you look up ni cyber's twitter feed sorry to be so um just pass you on to something else but i have posted it there um um and anyone who's interested in cybersecurity, you're very interested to go along to that. So um, if you haven't already applied for the program and you're interested, some council areas are at capacity, so you'll be on a wait list. But um, if you have applied, make sure you get through the next steps and get approved by the council. Um, and if you are on that, I'm delighted. Um, but yeah, anything else, let me know. I will share everyone's details, as I've said please fill out the feedback form. And if anyone has any more questions, um, you can quickly uh, shout out now. I only wanted to just point out, I've put in the, a link in the chat there about the, the kind of government advice on 5G and health. Brilliant, James, thank you very much. Um, okay, can, thank can you I very much, James. Say something, yeah. James? It doesn't matter, yeah. see why I'm in the science, biology and things like that there. It doesn't matter if I go to the tech, the tech thing you're talking about no oh, oh my god no. no um and i think okay. that, that's the really nice thing about the tech community the the, I, the iot um belfast which it, it shouldn't be iot belfast because it's it, the, the um martin and, and brian will host the the events all around the um the province but it, it really is about engaging with other sectors or people who are working in other areas because technology impacts like that's why you're on the program to see how you can use technology to help you know you I, your, your your business i i i'd always point out that um a lot of the tech community they they, they get the tech they you know they don't need advice on the kind of digital but but what they really like is engaging with people who are kind of the, the domain owners you know they 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 work in that area or they have an interest in that area so they can kind of get better insights themselves so i've yet to find um maybe there is one or two i don't know but i've yet to find a tech community meetup where if you turned up they wouldn't welcome you so um any of them and, and quite a lot of the time they're more than happy to to spend all night telling you everything about it anyway you know because they're enthusiasts themselves so um always always welcoming and uh always uh, ready to engage and i think that's i found it especially the case in belfast yeah. I wasn't, um, I, I may be involved in tech now, but I wasn't until I went to a tech community, a tech meetup. So there you go. Um, it's three tech meetups that, because I've always inter been interested in tech and um, hung around with friends who were in tech and I had, I, my background wasn't in tech. So I was like, well, I clearly, I can't do anything here. Um, but I turned up and got to socialize and um, got to meet Phil from uh, Flax and Teal at the Smart Cities Belfast launch in City Hall in 2017. Um, and he was the he's the main organizer for Blug and at that time OBIG um, with Jillian. Uh, so um, you get to meet people. And as James was saying there, you, we may have um, knowledge, uh, understanding of certain components and tools and techniques and software um, and hardware. But without the use cases, we're just like, uh, these, these are really cool things that we can do, but with no real application. And then when Open Data and I provide us with opportunities to apply for funding to do so, to create insights, like with what we have no use case. Oh look, <laughs> here's here's Marguerite with her um, protocols. You know, well, here let's do something. You know, so that's how those projects come together, and that's how you can start um, having tech collaborations in different industries and different sectors. It's through those meetups. Um, and just getting insights into where is the next, not next big thing, but next interest. Where, where is where is social where is the social 
scale moving and that's, you find that out through the social interactions that, such as at meetups. Yeah, absolutely. So Margaret, get signed up. That's what I'm saying. Brilliant. Okay, look, any more questions, sure, contact me and um, it'll take me just to download this snippet and then upload it again, but um, I'll share the, the recording too. So, You're welcome. Look, thank, you very, thank you very much to everybody, um, our presenters and, and for everyone for dialing in and um, hopefully we'll see you again at some of the next webinars and uh, have a nice afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.